densely packed old city. The US general in charge of the anti-IS coalition says there's evidence IS leaders and foreign fighters are trying to leave. Air Force Brigadier General Matthew Isaac says IS fighters are disorganized and their stores of carbons have been depleted by US-led airstrikes. Matt Brown, ABC News, Beirut. The Federal Transport Minister says the government won't stand in the way of those wanting to conduct a private search for missing Malaysia Airlines flight MH370. It's three years since the Boeing 777 disappeared without a trace and the families of some victims are raising funds for a private search for the plane. Australian, Malaysian and Chinese authorities suspended the official search in January after they were unable to locate the... Australian Eastern Daylight Time, it's a quarter past nine. In South Australia, a quarter two nine. In Queensland, a quarter past eight. In the Northern Territory, a quarter two eight. In the West, it's a quarter past six. ABC News Radio Headlines. Today's top stories, catch me if you can, an Indian man on the run from federal police after posing as a doctor in New South Wales for 11 years. Also today, an elderly woman dies in an apartment fire on Sydney's northern beaches. And Queensland police call for public assistance to help trace a backpacker's route as they investigate a two-month kidnapping ordeal. Violence experts in Queensland are calling for frontline women's health workers to play a more significant role in combating domestic violence. They say government legislation is not enough to combat it alone and that it needs a whole of community approach. Domestic violence remains the headline issue this International Women's Day, with experts pointing out it's still the biggest inhibitor for gender equality in Australia. Catherine Gregory reports. Frontline DV workers say pregnancy often signals the very beginning or a more intensive spate of domestic violence against women. Dr Kathleen Baird points out that intervention and support from health professionals during this period is key to combating DV. We feel that midwives have a unique relationship with uh, women during their pregnancy. When you have that relationship, women are more likely to disclose to someone that they trust. Um, so again, we have to support and help midwives to, to be able to recognise and re respond and, and support women when, when they ask for that help. Dr Baird is the Director of Midwifery and Nursing at the Gold Coast University Hospital and is also on the Queensland Domestic and Family Violence Implementation Council. Training midwives, nurses and other health professionals in how to help women experiencing DV is one of the recommendations she made to Queensland's 2015 Not Now, Not Ever report. And it's being put into practice at Dr Baird's hospital with the implementation of a domestic violence specialist worker. And part of that role is to, to educate, to train staff to respond effectively to um, a positive disclosure, but also perhaps recognize the signs that there may be domestic violence occurring in, in a, a relationship, but also having the information and the tools available to know how to respond and refer onto our community agencies who are the skilled professionals at supporting women in domestic violence relationships. Diane Mangan from DV Connect points out Queensland is the only jurisdiction which has formalised the role of women's health professionals in the frontline domestic violence sector. But she says DV cases are still growing and intensifying and government legislation to combat it is trying to keep up. There's quite a bit of activity happening within the state, both government and non-government, and quite a lot of it happening in rapid succession that it will take time to see the results of some of the changes. The whole concern is that the long-term safety of family, we're certainly, to some extent, addressing the immediate safety needs, but we have to consider also the long-term effects. Libby Davies, the CEO of White Ribbon Australia, agrees and says this International Women's Day is a chance to recognise both policy improvements in this space 
but also the outstanding challenges. So we have made advances, huge advances, but we need to because we do know that the statistics are still horrendous. In 2016, 71 women lost their lives. That is more than one woman a week. We understand and appreciate that violence um, is perpetrated in, in such a prolific way across our community that it is absolutely affecting the rights of women to live um, with true gender equality. So women's advancement is being held back. That's Libby Davies from White Ribbon Australia, ending that report by Catherine Gregory. Meantime, the Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has started International Women's Day with a visit to the Australian Defence Force Academy. Joined by the Defence Minister Maurice Payne, Mr Turnbull highlighted the growing role of women within the Defence Force. We're celebrating the achievements of women in the Australian Defence Force and here at the Academy. And we thank you, the women of the ADF serving here and overseas. Each of you are magnificent role models for young women and girls right across Australia. And I'm delighted that Major General Simone Wilkie is here with us today, a great example of the change that has occurred over time in the ADF. When Major General Wilkie started out 30 years ago, one of the regular jobs for young soldiers was guard duty at Victoria Barracks in my electorate in Sydney. And this was a job that uh, Major General Wilkie couldn't do because she was a female soldier. But three decades later, she's the first female commander on operations in Afghanistan. She embodies her belief that women should do, should be able to do and can do anything and everything in the ADF, in every role. There's a role model for young women coming up through the ranks. She's a great example of the motto, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Role models are leading by example. The opportunities that have opened up for women in the ADF since Major General Wilkie, first war, uniform of Australia, are extraordinary. Women in defence are making a huge contribution across the range of military planning, policy, operations, in support of our national interest. This year, women make up more than 20% of all recruits to the ADF. And I was just discussing with some of the naval officers here, 29% of the recruits into the Navy. And they represent more than 25% of those who joined the Australian Defence Force Academy. There are now 266 women serving on current overseas ADF operations, representing more than 13% of the total deployed force. And Australian service women now comprise 16% of the permanent full-time ADF. There are currently 82 women in senior officer positions, compared to 48 in February 2012. Now, this progress could not have been achieved without a real push from defence to attract and recruit women, to recruit the best men and women to the ADF, but also to focus on ensuring that more young women and girls come into the ADF and follow the example of so many of you here, demonstrate that women can do, will do, are doing everything in the nation's service in the ADF. And that was the Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull speaking at the Australian Defence Force Academy a little earlier this morning. Documents obtained by the ABC have revealed inside details of last year's census meltdown. With more, we're joined now by our political reporter Ashlyn McGee at Parliament House. Ashlyn, thanks for your time this morning. Good morning. What exactly do these documents reveal? Look, these documents were obtained uh, under a freedom of investigation, uh, freedom of information rather, investigation by my colleague Dan Conifer. And what he was looking for was communication about how prepared the ABS chief, the chief statistician David Kalish, and the head of the Australian Census, Duncan Young, were for the type of attack that brought down the website. So he asked for a uh, correspondence that mentioned DDoS attacks or distributed denial of service attacks in the three months. Apologies, that's my mobile ring <laughs> in the three months leading up to that botched census. Now, of course, we all remember that that census website was out for about 40 hours. Millions of Australians were left unable to complete their census. And 
and IBM, the company uh, involved with the technology behind it, ended up apologising and reaching a confidential settlement with the government. But it was a very costly mistake. And when we looked at these documents, what was returned was three pages only that had been sent to Mr Young. And in those three pages, just nine lines related to the risk of a DDoS type attack. Now, one of those lines, I think, is pretty indicative of how prepared they were. And it says, at a high level, our architecture resists DDoS, DDoS attacks by use of multiple layers of security. Uh, so playing down the risk there or the concern there, saying that they were prepared for it, which obviously they weren't. But perhaps even more interesting is the fact that Australia's chief statistician, David Kalish, didn't have any correspondence about DDoS attacks in the lead-up to the census. So it appears he wasn't prepared, at least from the correspondence that we've obtained, uh, and received no communication about the risks. So, Ashlyn, given that fact, how do you see this playing out politically? And have we had any response so far from either the government or the opposition? Look, we have, and Labor has all along attacked the politicians, not the public servants, for the census fail. Now, uh, even though David Kalish is a very highly paid public servant, uh, receiving some $700,000 a year, Labor says the ultimate responsibility is with the minister responsible, which is Michael McCormack. Now, in response to the ABC's questions, Michael McCormack said that clearly improvements are needed uh, next time the census comes around. But he says overall the census was a, a success. 96% of Australians completed the census last year, he says. Uh, but he's also pointed out that in the lead up to next year's election, uh, next year's census rather, or the next census, I should say, that he will take a more hands-on approach to avoid this happening again. Ashley McGee and our have more throughout the morning. But let's take you now overseas because China says it will take measures to defend its security after South Korea and the United States began deploying a missile defense shield. The Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System is designed to protect against threats from Beijing's ally, North Korea, which on Monday fired a series of missiles into the sea of Japan. A Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson, Greg Shuang, made clear Beijing's displeasure. The only thing I want to emphasize is that we resolutely oppose the deployment of THAAD in South Korea by the United States and South Korea and will firmly take the steps necessary to protect our own security interests. Let's get more now with the BBC's defence and diplomatic correspondent, Jonathan Marcus. Responding to the news of the THAAD deployment, a foreign ministry spokesman in Beijing insisted that his government would resolutely take measures to defend China's security interests. All consequences for this, he said, will be borne by the US and South Korea. THAAD is designed to defend against short and medium-range ballistic missiles, like those with which North Korea threatens the South not intercontinental range weapons with which China might target the United States. Beijing's concerns largely relate to THAAD's powerful radars. It fears that these could alert other defensive systems based in the continental United States, thus warning the US of any surprise nuclear attack. But Washington already has sophisticated radars in Japan and a THAAD system in Guam. So what additional benefit it might gain from the South Korean-based radars is unclear. BBC's defence and diplomatic correspondent Jonathan Marcus. The revolution starts here. We live in a fast world. Information at our fingertips. You are fake news. We lead busy lives. What can I say? No wonder it can be hard to keep up. Who represents what you're interested in and your values? I really want to have a voice. Immigration, is that a big issue in a place like this? Each week, the link will take the stories we're all talking about and explain what it means for you. The link with Stan Grant is now available on iView. It's time now to check traffic conditions again with Greg Demopoulos from the Australian Traffic Network. Greg, good morning. Good morning, Sienna. Starting off in Brisbane, there's been a collision in Sunnybank Hills. That's on Pinelands Road heading outbound just after Hallowell Road. There's also been a collision in North Lakes. That's on Little Burke Street at the roundabout to Endeavour Boulevard. On the Gold Coast, you'll find the Smith Street Motorway near the eastbound from Pacific Pines through to Gavin in Sydney. Crews are dealing with a two-car collision in Botany. That's on Botany Road at Daphne Street. And in Regent's Park, you'll find lights on Flash at Joseph. Joseph Street at Amy Street, so please do take care through the area. In Canberra, you'll find London Circuit very congested in all directions. The same goes 
Or I should say, the same does not go for the Majura Parkway. That's actually moving along quite nicely. Moving now down to Melbourne. In your memory, there's been a collision on the Princess Highway near Olive Road and in Maidstone on Ballarat Road near Ashley Street. In Hobart, you'll find Macquarie Street very congested heading through the CBD. Dillon Park Road also busy in both directions between both Main Road and the Brooker Highway. In Adelaide, crews are dealing with a two-car collision in North Adelaide on Hackney Road at Bundy's Road. There's also been a three-car collision in St Mary's on Ellipse Road at Stanlake Avenue. Moving across to Perth, we've got reports of okay. a collision on the Quinana Freeway that's heading northbound, approaching Thomas Road. It is causing some delays on the approach. You'll also find the Mitchell Freeway busy now southbound from Hodges Drive right through to Hepburn Avenue. Darwin looking incident-free. I'm Greg Demopoulos. More ABC News Radio traffic in half an hour. Thanks, Greg. We'll talk to you then. Good morning. You are listening to ABC News Radio Mornings. Fiona Ellis-Jones here with you this Wednesday, the 8th of March. Thanks for your company this morning. Australian Eastern Daylight Time, just about 9.30. It is now 9 o'clock in South Australia, 8.30 in Queensland. In the Northern Territory, it's 8 o'clock. In the West, it's 6.30. ABC News Radio. Making news this morning, medical advocates say the penalties for impersonating a doctor are inadequate. It comes as police look for a man who allegedly pretended to be a doctor and worked at several New South Wales hospitals over a period of more than 10 years. As David Marchese reports, it's the latest...